All right. Hi, my name is Joe Holtzclaw. I'm the uh, run game coordinator and offensive line coach at Winona State. Uh, go a little bit about myself to start. I played football at Northwest Missouri State. Um, I was probably the shortest tackle to play Division II football. I started 43 games in, at 6-1, so I hold that title. I don't think many people compete for it. Um, but after Northwest, I stayed on, and, and I was a graduate assistant there for a couple years. Um, and then my first full-time job was at an NAIA school, uh, Hastings, Nebraska, and I was the coordinator there for four years. And then went to Kearney, Nebraska, a Division II school out there for a couple seasons. I was out there for two seasons, and then now this is my fourth year uh, here at Winona State. And um, we've had a great run just in my, my short time kind of here. We 26 and 7 kind of in the conference since we've been here and I'll go through and, and kind of go through the way we build our offense and hopefully you guys can connect a little bit with some of it. My contact will be on there at the end. If anybody has questions, I'd be happy to follow up and answer anything um, you guys might have. But the basis of the talk today is going to be uh, building run schemes and how we build them in a game plan. I think, uh, you know, coming from an offense that we did a lot of power and said we were going to line up and pound power. I think there's good times for that. And, and coaches certainly have their, you know, their philosophies where they have a play and they think you should be able to run it all the time. And I think there's something to that. Um, we are a very, very traditional pro style offense and use all the different motions and all the different personnel groupings and formations. And in order to take advantage of all those different pictures, we have to be able to run a ton of different schemes. And so what I'll do is I'll kind of buzz you through um, how we build that stuff and, uh, and hopefully spark some interest here. Uh, building the run game for me, your offensive line, especially in a system like this, we start from the basics. We start from scratch just with the steps. So basically, you know, what I tell my guys is I'm going to get you through the first two or three steps. And after that, it's a fight. It's going to be a dog fight no matter what play we're running, no matter if we're passing the ball or running the ball. I'm going to get you to the spot we need you at. And then the rest is basically going to be on your attitude and your effort to finish those blocks. So um, must knows we're a balanced strike team, meaning for me, we try to strike our hands on the second step in any concept and any block that we're running. Um, we've adopted the lateral vertical um, run, uh, run steps. So what that means for me is – whether we're blocking zone right and we go lateral and then vertical and we stay on these tracks or we're blocking power right and we go lateral on the down block and track this way, for us, we try to tie all the footwork together um, because when you run as many concepts as we do, you've got to be able to practice the footwork efficiently and effectively. And so uh, lateral vertical covers a lot of the things we do. We use it for our down blocks. We use it for, again, zone tracks and gap schemes and all the different things. So. Um, them understanding that and taking a belief in it is a huge piece. Um, being conceptual understanders, you're going to hear me a lot talk about that. Our guys need to know where the running back's aiming point is. They need to know who he's reading so that we don't give cloudy reads. Uh, the worst thing in the world is your tackle half reaching a DN on outside zone and then letting him out of that reach block and messing up where the back's supposed to go. And so it's very important that our offensive linemen know who the running back is reading and know how to give them a clear read. Um, and then flipping the switch for me, when you hear me talk about that is gonna be a situational type thing. Flipping the switch when it's third and one, uh, we really talk about like all the rules go out the window. It's, it's just put your hand down. I don't care if you're in four points or what you're in, but we gotta get that yard one way or the other. Um, and, and we talk a lot about that and that's just, you know, getting it done when it's gotta be done. How to be grimy, I was always told that your position group is a reflection of you. And I thought that that was a, a word that described me whenever I was a player, uh, just at the end of the day, doing what you got to do to get the job done. Sometimes you got to dig a little bit and, and try some unorthodox things to, to get stuff done. And, and being grimy is a word that I think our guys use um, in situations. So uh, proper communication, I'm not a huge over communicator. You can't be, unfortunately, in, in this system. 
because we have so many different combos. Sometimes we're using vertical combos. Sometimes we're using very lateral uh, down the line combos. Uh, sometimes we're just sealing people. And so uh, we don't try to define each variation of those combos. We just wanna make some quick calls, uh, make sure we know we are an ID system. So make sure we know who the ID is and why he's the ID and what we're doing to get there. Hand placement and our O-line manual. And I think if you're ever building any type of run game or offensive line coach, you need to have an O-line manual that kind of further explains not just your playbook, but everything about your philosophy. For our guys on every single run play, on pass plays, they need to have proper hand placement. They need to know what that hand placement is. And again, simple examples for us, if we're going with our lateral vertical, if we're just talking inside zone, our hand placement is gonna be front side hand to front side shoulder, back side hand to center mass or the left breast plate if we're going to the right. If we're going outside zone, then we're gonna reach a little bit past that with our outside hand um, and just giving them something to practice over and over and over. Um, and obviously what we try to do is make that fit so that if we get line movements or shifts or things like that, how to fit with our secondary um, fits as guys move. And so hand placement and leverage is a huge piece, knowing that when we run zone, we can put two hands on the forward guy, but we can never put two hands on the guy behind us. And things like that, I think, are huge keys whenever we're building it. Um, I will preface everything by saying we probably default to running zone more. So you're going to hear a lot more of our standard issue rules for zone. And then the rest of the pieces around it are builders that we have off of, off of our zone game. So... Um, and then the last piece, I think, you know, no matter what level you're at and at any, you know, point, you're always going to be teaching guys to finish and chase the football. I tell everybody, you know, from recruiting on up, more so what I judge on film is how quick a guy can get up off the ground, whether he threw and missed or whether he knocked a guy down or whether he tripped and fell. I'm more interested to know if they can get back up off the ground and chase the football down. Those those balls tend to bounce your way whenever you got big guys chasing them. So um, <clears throat> those are kind of our run game must knows to get through it. We'll jump right in. This is the run game matrix for us. Um, again, however you build your run game, I think it's important that you develop this. And if you have IDs, if you don't have IDs, I think you can build this. I played at Northwest. We didn't ID people. So it's it's definitely possible to do all this. You can build it with covered, uncovered rules, however you want. Um, I built this one specific to Winona because we are an ID system. The quarterback sets all of our blocking schemes and all of our protection schemes. And so very important for me to be able to get the information to him of what looks we're looking for. Um, the way this sheet is built, and I'll kind of move my cursor around here, um, the ID is set for different people on each play. That's, a, that's a, a big thing for me so that not every scheme is set the same. We're not just always telling the center where to go. And then ID leverage tells the quarterback for each one of these plays over here where our ideal leverage is. So if we're running zone, we would like to stay in our zone tracks. And so anytime we do ID and we're running just inside zone, I would like it to be ID forward. And if we can't ID it forward, then we need to figure out why. And either we can't run that play again, or we've got to have a, a, a play for him to get us out of it, okay? And no different if your quarterback does it, or if you're the offensive coordinator doing it, you, you need to have built in what your ideal looks are. And I think the more I've been in and, and learning offensive line, you know, for the last 12 years, there's those guys that just, you keep banging zone, and you just pick up who you can pick up. And I think, you know, there's some guys that have that belief. For me, in my heart, I want to run the best plays to the best leverage. And sometimes you got to expand your book a little bit in order to get those leverages. But again, this is built for our quarterback knows we ID it for the center. We want forward leverage. And then these leverage players are guys that are conflict players for that play. So if we're running inside zone at a tight end, the plus two defender or the blitz is the guy that's going to change us out of the play it's the guy that says either the safety's down or they're bringing edge of an edge defender that we can't do anything about that would make us lose our zone integrity okay if we're running it without a tight end 
It's just the plus one. He's going to tell us where the center's going. And if there's another guy that's causing an issue, well, then we can't, we can't throw that ball um, or we can't hand that ball off and run it there. And then far over here on the side, what you're going to see is this choice for us. That is the RPO. We don't run a ton of, but easy way to create pressure and problems with edge defenders. If you're running a zone play and people keep walking edge guys up, then put another guy out there and throw a bubble off of them. That's an easy way for us to, to fix that problem. If we want to stay in the zone place, um, or if we just like those, those looks. And so options for the quarterback, if the look isn't right, he can either change the play to the outside zone play away from a blitz. He can check it to three step or he can throw an RPO off of it. And again, it doesn't matter if you have a quarterback do it or if you do it as a coordinator, you just need to know who the conflict defender is for that, for your scheme and how you're going to handle them. Right. So, um, Covered, uncovered rules are kind of built that way. So if I'm covered, I have this rule. If I'm uncovered, I do this. And then we have general pieces that move us in the directions of place. Um, outside zone built similarly. Um, we, we conflict more with that one based on where the ID leverage is. So if we want to ID this one back, which is what you can see if we're running it to our tight end, I'm a huge, let's set the edge and let the running back know he's one-on-one -on -one with the safety. Um, and possibly we can get that guy dug out with a, a receiver. Then I'm a huge, just can the center get to the guy or not? And if he can, then we should be able to fit that play right. Um, again, if we need to change it, where if we don't have great leverage and we would need to ID it forward, well, IDing it forward falls right back into our inside zone rules. So ID it forward and then change us to inside zone and we'll block it and we'll just keep everything tight. Um, again, 26 is a power play for us. It's true power. You'll see it, some examples of this in a little bit um, based on, you know, there's guys that want to run power no matter what. So whether you would change it based on the, the safety leverage um, or wherever that backside defender is for us, again, if you're talking about a four, three defense that are, or, one of those inside linebackers are bumped over or cheating towards the play side. We don't like to run plays when there's more than one guy stacked at the point of attack for us. So those are pictures that our quarterback knows. And again, we can either change it to a, a counter play away um, or we can change it and run an outside zone into, into blitzes. Um, G lead. I know some people run a lot of G uh, more as one back plays. The only way we run G here right now is as a two back play where we have the G kick and then the fullback lead through. So it ends up being a C gap play for us and game planning wise, it's, it's planned out as a C gap play. And you'll see a couple examples of that. Um, a gap power is a counter, you know, to these. So if we're getting a ton of flow out of our power plays, then we come back and we hit a gap power and try to get guys overflowing. So, Again, going back to the build process, when we talked about those rules on that first page, all of these plays are vertical combo plays where we're not trying to wash people down the line. We're trying to blow people off the ball. Then we get down to A-gap power and we're trying to remove people laterally. We're trying to wash everybody by, get linebackers running over the top, and then we'll try to hit, hit a vertical lane or cut back off the power look. Um, variations of out 18 for us, we've got pin and pull. And again, this isn't all for the presentation. This is the actual matrix we use. So I'm, I don't, I'm not, we're not going to watch film on it, but we have this built for our, our quarterback. So when we run pin and pull, he knows all the things that we like and don't like. When we run duo, um, he, he knows what we like and don't like and how to check in and out of it and what we can run RPOs off of. Uh, fly sweeps for us, we always run it with a leader back. So the outside blitzer doesn't usually worry us it's more so if we have extra hats out there um, or the problem and then of course um, one of our staples here is running the statue and we got to have rules built in for that for good and bad as well so moving through we'll kind of go through a few of these schemes um, and try to bust through as many kind of thought process issues as we have again inside zone for us is a forward id is what we want. It's an interior run play. We want to stay on our zone tracks. We still use lateral vertical. 
edge pressures are the things we try to avoid. I didn't put any issues on here. I just put more so what we were looking for out of the plays um, and then RPOs, three steps and outside zones. So I know this stuff gets a little bit laggy um, when we you do it, um, when we're recording it and things. So I'm gonna try to go as slow as I can. But for us structurally, um, inside zone, here would be the ID. That's our forward defender. That cuts these two loose where they can scoop through. We don't necessarily hard combo guys. So what you should see out of 77 is a good lateral step first to make sure we don't have any movement and then a press back and then he'll worry about fitting um, that linebacker late. And so again, we'll kind of buzz through this. Um, there's the full wash and the fit tight end reach blocking on the back side. And again, for us, when we talk about these outside zone plays or inside zone plays, uh, our focus is more to stop D line movement first and foremost, and then fit linebackers late. So what you'll see out of 77 is a zone step and then a press back to stop that D line movement. And then he'll fall off to finish the wash. And that's that to me is what's dictating our internal cuts. Um, our guys know to go back to the first page, as soon as we go to fit this and we're getting forward movement by these linebackers, well, they know the running backs are looking there. They're not gonna keep running to where linebackers are flowing. So we know now we can fit blocks inside out and make it a full wash situation. And that goes back to kind of the conceptual understanding piece of it. Um, and all tie together with the running back. Again, I'll just give you a look at it here. It's not any different, but you can see the movement. Um, same situation, if you watch the center, two hands forward, one hand back, and that creates our, our finish and our wall. Um, same thing, you get a look at the guard, zone step, eyes, press, and then go get caught up and create our wash. So effort, effort, effort on all the blocks, make sure we're finishing. We should all be blocking when the whistle blows at the end, right? Another zone play, this is more of a split zone. Again, we're a 21-12 team. So this is out of a 12 set, uh, two tight end kind of set over here. You're gonna get a swipe back. Again, you have to decide as a play caller or you know how you're gonna set these up. If you want the quarterback to ID you to stay in here, if you want us to be pushing, when we run it to the tight end, Right, our center is responsible for for the mic. Our tackle tight end then becomes responsible for the plus one, and these two guys are responsible for the minus one. So everybody's steps go together. Work on stopping D line movement first, and then get level two covered up. And so, really good look by this one, where before those two linebackers came flying over the top, so we became wash defend wash blockers. Now you're gonna see these two guys stay rocked back. So these blocks, rather than being washes, will be seals, okay? And you'll kind of see how that unfolds. Sorry about that. You'll kind of see how that unfolds here. So rather than creating full wash, stick their foot in the ground, now we become seal defenders. And just understanding what the back's looking at, trying to make him right, our right tackle, if you watch him, does a good job here of trying to figure out, you'll hear me talk about most threatening defender. Yes, their plus one is out here, but we're never going to leave the box to go try to fix one of those blocks. So he secures his gap. He looks for help. He looks for help. He refits. He's just going to keep on his zone track until everything settles in. Um, center does a great job checking, helping play side, then fitting his guy, getting us to fit the seal, the running backs running tough. Okay, so that gets us kind of through the inside zone piece. And again, there's a thousand different things, obviously we can kind of talk about through those, but um, making sure you guys know how to fit those blocks is a huge piece. It's a huge piece for how we do things again, just because we run so many different schemes. For outside zone, I know, you know, there's a huge contingency and some guys run what's called wide zone and some people actually run outside zone. So I put two different looks on here. I prefer this play to be ID back, meaning I want us to set a hard edge and then let the running back split the C gap and have one-on-one -on -one with the safety. 
some people would rather ID forward and get everything moving lateral and chase those guys. And so I put both of them on here. I think there's room for both of them. Um, we'll carry both of them and it'll depend on who we're playing that week as to how I want to use them. But this first one is a ID forward because he is in front of the center. If you saw right here, our quarterback walk up, reads the picture. He puts the ID to the guy in front of the center. So this is technically a forward ID for us, which puts us all at a little bit of a disadvantage in chase, but our center is really athletic. So you'll see on here, he will get to 36. Takes a great aiming point, lays 36 down, which I know some high schoolers, high schools don't get that, have that luxury. Um, we do at college and we use it. So Otherwise, on the edge, you can see how the tight end, what I, we talk about with those guys is they're going to shuffle, shuffle, again, secure anything through their gap first, and then they'll add in. So you'll see him shuffle, shuffle. We don't need help on the edge. Then he goes and fits his defender and keeps him away from the play. And again, for me, that goes back to the understanding piece. Those guys need to understand that these guys out here are the last and least important players. We got to get the edge set. We got to make sure we keep our leverage. We got to make sure we get the guys we're supposed to get to. And so he's technically supposed to get 37, but he's going to make sure we got our edge first, and then he's going to go get 37. So again, keep the read clean for the back. He's reading. He's basically reading 44. So our tackle right now ends up knowing it's going to be a wash. So he keeps him pushed to the sideline, finishes him out run through the arm tackle okay so that's more of the look again if it's id forward of how how that's going to shake down for us we still like to cut backside defenders our guard didn't get it done on the backside otherwise 91 wouldn't have been in chase and I, it would have been even a cleaner look <clears throat> here's one from the other shot um you'll hear so for outside zone for us you're going to get bucket steps believing in my you know my thought process is we're going to give a little bit of ground to gain a little bit of ground if d lineman takes six, six inch steps vertical we're going to give them those six inches while we're gaining three feet sideways so if you watch after we take these steps we should all look the same we're all taking our bucket steps we've all let the d lineman take their vertical steps and then as soon as that happens we need to get our second foot in the ground and we need to start creating vertical pressure, okay? And I think what gets lost in this play the most is O-lineman being okay with keeping this thing on the line of scrimmage. And you have to fight this drill. You have to do this drill every single day where as soon as you get engagement, you start trying to dominate defenders and press them out of the way. And this is a pretty good look by the left guard and the left tackle of taking our steps. We're always gonna check next man play side. And then as soon as we have guys, we start finishing blocks. And it's always great block. And we have receivers here that block their tails off. And that makes life a lot easier here. So, okay, now we're going to run it my way uh, or my preferred way. We're going to ID it back. And again, you can already tell this isn't a great leverage situation for them. They have two guys hanging over the edge. The reason they have two guys hanging over the edge is because we run a ton of G lead out of this look. So we will down block these guys and get a kick out and they want that extra hat out here to help with the G lead play. So we, we match this play up with our G lead play. Now they've cheated outside. We still ID it back. You can see the quarterback put it to the backside linebacker. So our center left guard are gonna be working to him. Our right guard and tackle are gonna be working to him and we're going one-on-one -on -one and one-on-one -on -one with those two guys. Um, these two, and I, you know, I think it's a luxury we have that some people, some other guys don't. We have tight ends and fullbacks that can block and they can block their tail off. So you watch these two guys, we feel great about our one-on-one -on -one blocking situations. And then here's the hard edge you get out of the tackle and guard. And there's your C gap play, and he's one on one with that safety again, which is what we want for him. Um, again, you'll right tackle is a little bit slow out of his stance, but what we want is when we pause this thing is that we've all taken our bucket steps, we've all got our eyes to the next man play side to start in case there's any dedicated movement. 
And then as soon as that's not happening, watch 64, put his foot in the ground and go create a vertical seal. And that's how we're gonna create the seam for the C gap. And again, there's different philosophies on how to fit this play. Um, that's just how we do it. And I think what's most important about when you're game planning is that you know how to dictate the gaps in the run game whenever you wanna fit them. So that's that. Get guys that are chasing the football, finishing blocks downfield. Okay, here's another 19 play. Again, now he IDs 32, so this is an ID back. We all have good leverage. It's without the tight end. That was why we put this one in. Um, he did ID it back, but what you're going to see on this is we have line movement. So our center ends up having to take these D linemen slanting, and then we get our, our front side guard up to the actual ID. Um, and you're going to see one of the issues under center with a fast – with a fast center and a slow quarterback is he gets stepped on every once in a while. So Owen doesn't quite get out of there. He gets it off, but he gets the ball handed off. Um, again, legal or not, we've got these receivers that do a great job blocking. So we did a double crack on this one to create seams. And then there's the reach and the fit out of your two, your left guard and your tackle. So they know that they're going to the IDs. And if we get cracks, like for us, again, this is just a whole different blocking scheme. But if we set cracks, then they know that their ID goes to whoever those cracks were coming from. So they should be working out to replace these um, receivers out here. But everyone else fit the play the way they were supposed to. And then there's your C gap seam again. So regardless of how we do it, our running backs, our offensive line know that when we run our outside zone schemes, we're trying to hit through that C gap, no matter how we create the seams or the cuts or whatever we're doing. Okay, getting into power. Um, this is our 26. You'll see the number up there is a 26. Open for us is away from tight end. This is generally how we run power it is a weak side power play. Uh, down gap scheme, under, everybody understanding it's, you know, Similar thought process to zone. We stay on our tracks down. We get a combo and we can get a combo. Uh, looking to follow it through the B or C gap. Uh, guys that mess this up again, I'll talk about it. The guys that can mess this play up is if we were motioning over and 31 was with them and there's two hats on this side of the center, now we've got bad leverage. As it is, we've got great down gap leverage on this play. They've bumped extra people over to our fullback. We're going to motion them over. Not a lot of movement with them. Now we work through our combo. The one thing we do a little bit different is we don't block back on three techniques. Everybody's got a different opinion about that. We pull our center. I'm not a big fan of trying to get back a gap and a half to go get that guy. So we'll just power pull this cat um, at center. Again, he's athletic enough to read it. There's the fit. There's the receiver block. And we're looking to run this play through the C, wide C gap. If they try to box it all in, we'll bounce it. Um, if, we'll get, if we can get kicks, we'll get kicks. Uh, one guy that didn't get it done was the tackle got a little bit hung up on that vertical. He ended up getting the guy pinned off, I think, versus a good linebacker. He probably beats us over the top there. Um, but he ended up keeping him pinned in there. So, again, coaching points, understanding these funnel hinges, again, this is what stops moving. People start moving to stop zone plays. Then we come back, we run gap scheme to try to hold everybody's movements in, and then we'll bounce it out after some seals and kicks. So, you know, philosophy of why you run plays and how you run plays is totally up to you and how you want to coordinate your offense. For us, all these plays, this looks exactly like we would run our split zone. We line up right here and run 14 zone, and he comes our kick out. And then we'll come back and all of a sudden we'll run power the exact same way. So now we don't need to kick them out. We'll seal everybody in and bounce it to the C outside gaps. And again, there's our receiver block. And again, I can't emphasize enough how important that is um, whenever you're putting your run game together is having good, solid rules uh, for those guys. Okay, similar alignment now, motion over. 
Now we've got a tight end on the backside, so we're a 21 set. So we'll do a through a three-man scoop through. Um, and the only way you can do this, guys, and we understand as running backs and as pullers that we're trying to hit this play out here, right? Some guys that just call power to call power, they can't always say or or know that they're going to run this as an outside play. For us, we're all on the same page where this thing's supposed to hit. That's why I'm not worried about these people back here, right? We're going to scoop in and try to take care of the most immediate defenders, which is actually going to be this safety that's flying down here, okay? So you'll see them push everything through, get good seals back there. Again, tackle climbs, gets the linebacker sealed back. So down gap schemes, stay on tracks, if we can get the extra hat for us, the way we get the extra hat is if we can bring this three-man scoop through, that means our tackle can go to the front side guy rather than going to the backside guy. And we have a call for that. So when they're in this alignment where they have all these extra people back here, we will make a call that tells the tackle, go ahead and take the front side linebacker because we can get through to the backside one. Again, we're trying to bounce our power play wide. So that's a good look for us. Now we're pulling to the safety. And you got one-on-ones again. Okay. Um, the last scheme I'm going to go through is our G lead, just because it fits off of other our other stuff. It ends up fitting like a pin and pull scheme. Uh, it just, we're running it with a fullback and a one pulling O lineman rather than your two puller system. Um, still a C gap play, D gap play. Um, gap scheme for everybody on the front side, meaning it's a down gap look. If you're covered, you block down. Um, and then building it off of the leverage of the offensive center's man, which is a lot of times the ID. So for this, for our look, we build this. You'll see this is special because the running back actually dribbles the ball before he takes off on this one. But our two outside defenders, this is a little bit unorthodox. Normally we would run it out of 21 with our fullback right here. And we would get a true down block and then our fullback would seek out the Mike linebacker. When we get into our 12 personnel, we just do it as a two for two system down. Um, again, great leverage for us. This is where the centers guy is. He's all the way behind the play. So we're gonna pull a play side guy or center and then we're playing off of this guy's leverage. So you can see in this look, the guard's covered. So he's gonna block down, our center's gonna pull Tackle tight end have great leverage to hold their seal blocks. Again, there was the running back dropping the ball on the ground, picking it back up, but everybody did their jobs in terms of the seals and the kicks. So you saw earlier where Bemidji had put two extra guys out here because of this play. If you have two guys out here, we can run outside zone and seal them out. If you want to keep your guys in here, we can seal guys in and go attack the, the wide gap. And so that's how we tie all the schemes together. Um, again, get the running back one-on-one -on -one with that safety, and that's a matchup that we like, especially when we got guys like that. So good look at it there. Here's another look um, of G lead, jump the tight ends. Again, here's our 12 personnel set, same deal. Now we're in a three by one look rather than a dead side look. Still, one guy playing outside, a mass of humanity in here, um, seal it all in and attack the C-gap. They leave the wide guy. Our other tight end does a great job. Again, this is where ID system comes in. Here's our, here's our ID, meaning that's who they're to. Here's our center's guy. Now he knows that he's got to go make the play right. He steps down. We're leaving the end man. So he's got to go fix it and get to the safety which he does, and you attack the gap you want to attack. And again, for me, the most important part is that we're attacking the spots on the field that we want to attack because those are things I can control. Those are the things I can coach. The hard part is, is your guys have to understand whether we're trying to seal guys in or whether we're trying to push guys out, and then the back needs to understand it and where it's going to fit. And it's a, it's a great – you know, it's a complex system, but our guys do a great job learning it. I'll tell you right now, this is a true freshman, did not redshirt. This is a freshman. This is a freshman. So it's not a system that you can't run. It's It just takes a lot of time. Um, those are young guys. 64, the right tackle is a freshman tackle. 
So we were, we were, this was game 11 and we were about out of dudes at this point, but we had them out there and they were still blocking schemes uh, correctly. So um, I'll kind of recap and finish here with the championship qualities. Uh, these are things that I think you got to get ingrained into them. I talked a little bit, hand placements, they have to know where their hands go on every, on every play. Cause if they don't have an attack point, they're going to drift to the outside. You're going to get the holding calls. We do a lot of down blocking and front blocking. They've got to know exactly where those hands need to go. Um, you know, again, we get them in their first three steps and then we just tell them it's a fist fight. So getting them not over coaching, you know, how to finish that stuff, conceptual understanding. We talk a lot about most threatening defenders. There's times where your tackles, uh, your edge guys have to make best choice decisions. Sometimes defense has extra guys there. And sometimes you got to make decisions on those guys. Uh, running back aiming point. This finished stuff, guys, and everybody knows this, but this is the stuff that separates good from great. Getting guys to lock on and finish blocks, block through the whistle, chase the football. Those are the things that separate you. Um, you know, you can scheme all you want, but if you don't have guys that want to go out there and just get after people, it's tough to run football. Uh, we've, we've done a, a really – awesome job the coaching staff here a head coach and offensive coordinator has done a great job allowing me to kind of go out and get O linemen that you know that I want I've been here this is my fourth year so this I'm I'm through my full cycle uh, now I'm playing with you know the guys that I've recruited and I've coached and um, it's it's getting to be my brand you know of stuff and it's really fun so you know don't give up on it the building stuff takes a while it takes a long time to get that ingrained in people. Um, and then your old guys have to learn how to teach it to your young guys. And then you start having some fun doing things. So um, here's my contact info, please. If you guys have any questions, um, anything, my Twitter's on there. I'm, I'm a believer in Twitter, please. Uh, this is a great site. Uh, again, thanks to Blockers O-Line Academy. Um, and Jeff, I'm so pumped to get this stuff out here. Not just for me. I just think it's awesome to talk football. This is probably the only good thing that's come out of this pandemic is we, we've had a lot of t football talk online and access to videos and things and, and stuff that we haven't had access to before. So uh, if you get the opportunity, throw your ideas on tape. I'd love to watch them. I know everybody else would too. Uh, we all have some ideas that we all need to hear. So uh, please contact me if you guys have anything else. And thanks so much for your time.